Um, thank you all so much for coming out to hear a presentation on this amazing book. I don't know how many of you have read it or seen it, um, Co-Conspirator for Justice. It is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and as I said, we are getting two copies into the library. We just have had a, a supply chain issue as with so many things during this pandemic. But, um, um, and again, if we were having this event at the library, I would have a big pile of them for sale. Um, uh, and I do recommend getting your own copy also. Um, but it is, it is just a fascinating book. And I did get a sneak peek at this uh, presentation we're all about to see. <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. A few little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, I have you all muted now and I'm going to keep it that way through the presentation. And then afterwards, there will be a Q&A. And the easiest way to get my intention so I can um, unmute you for the, the Q&A is if you go down to where it says participants and you click on it, there's a little raise hand icon and I will be able to see that far easier than if you actually raise your hand because there are three pages of people for me to kind of go through and see what's going on. If you actually do raise your hand, I will find you, but just bear with me and um, um, you know, know that this is a format that isn't as easy as being in an auditorium and, and raising your hand. Um, but everybody will get to ask. The other um, issue is, uh, I just lost my train of thought, um, that um, if for some reason you do unmute yourself, I don't think you have that capacity, um, that, that you please do it again. I, I, know I have been in these um, rooms and people have unloaded dishwashers and, and all sorts <laughs> of stuff and there's feedback. And I just want to make sure that we all hear uh, Susan's um, uh, talk without any of that feedback or outside noise going on. None of that. Oops. Um, Another thing is Susan is going to share her screen and have a presentation for us, a PowerPoint. And normally what happens is up in the right hand corner of your screen, you will see some kind of view of people, of speakers, of either Susan or four speakers or a little grid of people, depending on how you have your settings. The best thing for you to do while the uh, PowerPoint is going on is to look for the icon that's just one little bar and click that and that will close out all of the views of all the people so that all you'll be seeing is Susan's um, screen and it won't be uh, in one of anything else on it and one of many people on it. Um, so, so none of it will be um, covering anything that she is showing you. So I highly recommend doing that. Um, and I think that is all I really have for housekeeping. So I think I am going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for the evening. <laughs> Just very briefly, I know a lot of you know her and I, I know a lot of you go way back with her and that's really exciting. But for those of you who don't, Susan M. Reverby is the McLean Professor Emerita in the History of Ideas and Professor Emerita of Women's and Gender Studies, Wellesley College. She has been coming to the Cape for half a century and has lived part-time in Wellfleet since 1990. She is currently the president, as well as founding member of the Wellfleet Seasonal Residents Association. Her latest book is Co-Conspirator for Justice, The Revolutionary Life of Dr. Alan Berkman. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan, mute myself, okay. and um, please enjoy this fascinating presentation. 
Thank you. Let me see if I got this right. So here's share screen and find PowerPoint and hold on and do a view a slideshow. Ta-da! Okay, how's that? Can you see it all? It's good. Good. Okay, terrific. Okay, hold on. I got to get rid of, I didn't do this. Okay, well, never mind. I'll just do that. Um, so I want to thank um, Jennifer Wharton at the library and my colleague and friend Linda Miller, who helped uh, be a co-conspirator for this, actually, for the opportunity, especially because um, trying to bring a book out during a pandemic is not exactly simple. And, and I thank all of you for taking the time this evening to endure another Zoom experience, which I hope will be short enough so that we have plenty of time for um, discussion. So I want to dedicate this talk to the memory of Congressman John Lewis and to this quote, which you've probably seen played over and over when he spoke it in the Congress last December. And he said, when you see something that is not right, not just, not fair, you have a moral obligation to say something, to do something. Our children and their children will ask us, what did you do? What did you say? So this book, Co-Conspirator for Justice, uh, reminds us that in the fight for social justice in the United States, there is a long history of racial alliances, some successful, others quite fraught with some people becoming allies who say something, to use Lewis's words, others more what we might call co-conspirators who do something, although Lewis did not use those terms. As a way to think about this question, I took this query about allies versus co-conspirators for the title of this book because of this 2016 quote from Alicia Garza, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Garza noted, the thing I don't like about the word ally, she said, is that it is so wrought with guilt and shame and grief that it prevents people from doing what they ought to do. Co-conspiracy is about what we do in action, not just in words. So I want to remind you, as this illustration of John Brown arguing with Frederick Douglass um, tells us in this painting, um, Douglas and, and uh, Brown were actually allies, but they argued over Brown's planned action to raid the federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry that Brown thought would lead to a slave uprising in 1859. Uh, okay. Oh, why is this not moving? Hold on just a second. Okay. Um, you could also say that the whites and blacks were co-conspirators when they made the historic march with Martin Luther King and John Lewis in 1960, 1965, sorry, from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, in part to protest the state troopers killing of a black man named Jimmy Lee Jackson, where Lewis was almost killed, and where white co-conspirators Viola Leozo and the Reverend James Reed, Reeb were murdered. Some of you here in Wellfleet, indeed, may have been participants yourselves, perhaps most recently this past July 4th in our Black Lives Matter march in what the Reverend William Barber calls the third reconstruction after the 19th century struggle to expand social democracy and the 20th century efforts to overcome disenfranchisement and social injustices. We have been fighting now really loudly, I think, since the 2010s to demolish the structures of white supremacy. We have to consider then what it will mean for white people to become allies or perhaps co-conspirators in this effort in a new social justice movement. While some of us believe in nonviolent, if confrontational action, others like this gentleman, Dwayne Dixon, who's part of a group called um, Red Wing, Red, Redneck Revolt. It's actually a left wing group called Redneck Revolt. He's from North Carolina. And he, this is a picture of him at the deadly demonstration in Charlottesville in 2017, where he was part of the group that helped save people who were cornered actually by anti, uh, by white supremacy people, um, Guarding, uh, trying to get at them in a uh, church, who thinks that the guns may be necessary for protection in this growing struggle. So will white allies keep things building into meaningful actions, we have to ask, or as historian Elwood Watson just asked this last week, history has demonstrated that all too often when the going gets rough and the intolerant white right-wing backlash monster fiercely flashes his teeth, so-called white liberal allies have recoiled in fear 
panicked, packed up, retreated, kept a low profile, and rode out the storm until things subsided, only managing to reemerge when the next seemingly monumental moment of social activism arrives. So if all the marching against police brutality can be seen as an allies performance of what we might call embodied, that is in our bodies language, what happens when it stops, as it inevitably will? What would it mean to be a white co-conspirator if we are serious about the long effort to dismantle structural racism and to fight state violence? Will it mean more marching and organizing or will there be even direct violence as we have seen in the past? When and if does this slip into what the state labels domestic terrorism? To consider this query, I want to speak briefly then about the subject of my book, the physician Alan Berkman, who did become a co-conspirator in the struggle for racial justice and an end to imperialist policies. Alan Berkman's high school classmates in the small New York State upstate city of Middletown recognized his smarts and voted him the boy most likely to succeed in 1963, as you can see when we put him in the janitor's closet. They put as the epigram under his photo, a man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. On his way to a brilliant medical career, the anti-war and civil rights actions of the mid 1960s mostly passed him by in college at Cornell, where he played football, was president of his fraternity and concentrated on getting into medical school or perhaps into a relationship with his classmate with the black gloves and cigarette and Audrey Hepburn look. But when black power advocate Stokely Carmichael spoke at Cornell in February of his senior year, Alan Berkman began to consider where his priorities might lie. He was a pretty straight liberal when Columbia took this uh, hilarious photo of an almost a mugshot of him as he entered their medical school. But the injustices and inequalities of American life overwhelmed him finally when he was there. Turning down a future as a privileged medical scientist after his internship year, he became a community doctor in some of the poorest sections of New York City. He was called upon to see the prisoners who survived the state's deadly attack on the Attica prison uprising in 1971 and snuck in with his future wife, Barbara Zeller, under the FBI guns and under their army personnel carriers at the American Indian Movement takeover at Wounded Knee in 1973 to bring in medical supplies and treat patients, reporting on the health and medical conditions there, both at a press conference and at state hearings. So this is Alan with Barbara Zeller and with Clyde Bellancourt, one of the leaders of the American Indian Movement. The violence Allen saw in the bodies of his patients and friends, either from the structural racism that took its toll in diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, or from the beatings and shootings by police conditioned his turn to more radical politics. Raised by a lower middle-class family that believed in action, toughened by years of football playing and athleticism, Berkman quickly moved from a concerned liberal willing to march in anti-war demonstrations to much riskier actions. He became the go-to doctor when someone was hiding in the political underground needing medical care, or the physician, um, why is this not moving? Hold on just a sec, sorry. Oh dear, hold on. Come on, oops. Oh, okay, here, let's just, just do it this way. Um, or the physician willing to t testify against the New York City police after excessive force was used in the cases of Puerto Rican, uh, the Puerto Rican group FALN's bomber, William Morales, here in a drawing from his um, trial. And then Seiko Adinga, who belonged to the Black Liberation Army, more in a minute. There is an expression used in teaching the underlying causes of mortality that fits Berkman's trajectory. When you're standing by a stream and are constantly peeling out dead bodies, it should occur to you to focus upstream to understand why the bodies are falling into the water in the first place. Berkman began to understand that all his medical skills, his abilities to titrate an appropriate drug or perform the right procedure could not save his patients. He had to look upstream to understand and to stop the mutilated and sick bodies he was seeing before him. Berkman joined increasingly like-minded comrades who he thought 
uh, who, who thought that a strong action-oriented stance against the twin problems of American imperialism and racism had to be taken. He was part of groups that were financially aiding the anti-colonial struggles in Southern Africa because they saw the links to the support of white-run regimes and American racism. He fought to support both Black, Puerto Rican, Native American, and white comrades whom he saw as political prisoners of the United States, as you can see from this demonstration in 1979. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, he provided leadership for what was called the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee that sought to educate whites about the presence of the Klan and white supremacy in multiple American institutions, but especially among prison guards. He used his doctor privilege to advocate for lower level workers in the health clinics that employed him and was fired at least once for his activism. He became more and more willing to consider what was called armed propaganda that met state violence with other forms of violence. Like many of us now, all of the brown and black bodies in the streets, in the prisons, or in his hospitals infuriated his egalitarian morality. He became part of a political group that called itself the May 19th Communist Organization after the birth dates of Ho Chi Minh and Malcolm X full of white people doing support for black and Puerto Rican other militant organizations of people of color. Some of his comrades had already participated in the successful effort in 1979 to free revolutionary and black liberation army member Asada Shakur from her New Jersey prison and to help keep her hidden until she could make it to Cuba where she still lives. Then Berkman was put in a situation that both called on his doctor skills and changed his life. Unbeknownst to him, women in his organization's leadership agreed to drive the getaway cars in a number of actions done by black men in a group, loosely part of what was called the Black Liberation Army. They had planned what was called an expropriation of a Brinks armored truck in Nanuet, just outside of New York City, to raise money for their cause in October 1981. What had been successful in gaining the money without killing anyone or on other occasions failed two local policemen and a Brinks guard were murdered, four members of the getaway group were caught, and another participant was gunned down the next day in a police chase. During the mayhem, one of the women getaway drivers pulled out her gun but accidentally shot herself in the leg, chattering bone and muscle. Bleeding profusely, her life was in danger. Going to an emergency room was out of the question since all gunshot wounds have to be reported and she was also known for having skipped out while on furlough from a previous prison sentence. Berkman was called. Although he had known nothing about the Brinks action beforehand, he felt he had to act. He saved her life and helped whisk her away from capture. The state and federal government then went after everyone they thought was in this gang of quote, domestic terrorists and the worst part of the racist imaginary of America, black men with weapons and white women as their accomplices. Allen served eight months in the New York City jail in 1982 for not speaking to a grand jury about what he knew about his comrades' actions. Once released, he knew he was about to be indicted yet again and that he might be facing decades in prison. He made another difficult choice. Leaving behind his wife and young children, he disappeared into the political underground in 1983. The government did not think that Berkman's misdemeanor, remember all he'd been charged with at this point, was treating but not reporting a gunshot wound, was so minor, and they charged him as an accessory to murder after the fact because he refused to tell them anything. He thus became, we think, only the second doctor in American history after Samuel Mudd, who treated John Wilkes Booth after the Lincoln assassination, to have such a charge for acting as a physician but not reporting the case. The bench warrant issued for him assumed he was armed and dangerous. For the next two years, between 1983 and 1985, Allen and others in his group tried to make the price of imperial and racist actions high as they did become armed. They did non-lethal bombings of a number of American political sites from an FBI office in Staten Island to the US Senate antechamber. They were careful to make sure no one was harmed or killed, but of course they might've been. They used fake IDs and even, oh, there's his FBI armed and dangerous line. And this is Allen's FBI file um, and the picture of him supposedly with his bad wig um, as um, David Morris. 
They did um, fake, used fake IDs. Here's Alan as Leonard Cohen. Oh, I'm not sure he meant the singer. Um, and even did robberies, as in this picture, um, where Alan and another comrade used faked FDA badges and, a, and threatened a pharmacist with their guns to gain needed funds from a robbery in Connecticut. After two years, one by one, they were caught, mostly because actually they refused to use their weapons against law enforcement and tried for what they were, were seen as political acts, but the government claimed was criminality, even terrorism. Numerous trials ensued, including one for conspiracy in what they labeled themselves as the resistance conspiracy case. Berkman was given 10 years um, from an earlier trial, others in his group received sentences that went from two to five times longer because their connections to the found munitions and guns and gunpowder were easier to prove. All of them eventually got out of prison, although Marilyn Buck, seen here on the left in this photo, and who was the one Alan treated after Brinks, died of ovarian cancer two weeks after she was let out on a compassionate release in 2010. During the long years he served his time in some of our worst dungeons, often in solitary, Berkman developed on top of all of this, two rounds of cancer that nearly killed him again and again because of the incompetent excuse for treatment that pervaded so-called prison healthcare. In fact, his comrades settled the resistance conspiracy case because they feared continuing the trial might really kill him as he was so deadly sick. When he wasn't extremely sick, he provided healthcare doctoring to numerous of his primary Black and Latino prison mates, earning his moniker Brother Doc. He understood in his bones what it meant to be disrespected and not treated humanely, both in medicine and daily life. So here is Alan talking about what it meant to have cancer in prison. Alan at the Manhattan Correction Center talks about having cancer in prison. Trying to go out to a hospital to get tests, trying to be seen by a decent doctor, trying to get adequate treatment at every step of the way, what happens is that, quote, the security issues become the cover story for the fact that they either would try to break us or let us die. He also was asked to give a test, was interviewed for a 60 minutes program um, while he was in prison on, um, on prison health care. And here's Alan on 60 Minutes. I have gotten decent medical care, but not from the federal prison system, in spite of the federal prison system. What do you think your condition would be if you weren't a doctor? I think I'd be dead. So, oh gosh, this is just not moving. Hold on just a second, sorry. Um, even artists who never met Allen most understood that he was a co-conspirator to others in the most militant sections of the left. They painted this mural that linked him to Leonard Pelletier. The, you can see the four um, pictures on the left of the screen. To Leonard Pelletier of the American Indian Movement, to Dilcia Pagan of the Puerto Rican group, the FALN. This third picture is of Allen and the fourth one is of Geronimo Pratt from the Black Panther Party. Alan Berkman used his prison time to reconsider what he had done and to see the limitations both of small group politics and the turn toward violence. As I wrote in the book, he was really good at being a revolutionary, but not so good at leading a revolution. He never changed his principles, but he began to reconsider his tactics. He had to figure out too what he might do if he survived his sentence. His lawyer was able to get New York State to let him renew his medical license if he promised to care for the poor. It was never an issue. Released in 1992, for the next decade, he became an expert on the care of those with HIV AIDS in the Black and Puerto Rican sections of New York City, working out of a nursing home health center called High Bridge Woody Crest in the Bronx. Always interested in global concerns, he became connected with those who shared his perspectives at Columbia University's Public Health School, where he learned more and more about the epidemic and how to do research. Reminder too, if you can look at the numbers around um, 2000, before we get um, the antiretrovirals, AIDS was a horrendous death sentence and it was getting worse and worse in other parts of the country, of the world. Horrified by the way the international AIDS community was not making the life-saving drugs available to those in the global south, despite claiming, as the title of the International AIDS Conference um, put it in 1998, they were bridging the gap he was spurred to action again. Jeez, hold on, uh, sorry. 
This time he made both local and global connections and especially with the treatment action campaign in South Africa and the AIDS ACT UP groups in New York and Philadelphia to form an organization called Health Gap, the Health Global Access Project in 1999. With direct confrontations with political leaders, including Al Gore then running for president, brilliant lobbying and demonstrations, they were able to get US policy change to allow generic forms of the new drugs into other countries at reasonable costs. The actions probably saved millions of lives. This is a picture of Alan and Barbara Zeller, his wife, toward the end of his life. And then this is a picture of, oh dear, sorry. No. Alan's daughters, Sarah Zeller Berkman and Harriet Clark. Alan spent the last decade of his life training another generation of global health, public health practitioners as he worked in Uganda, uh, in South Africa, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, and many other countries. As his friend Ezra Susser explained, it was difficult, as you can imagine, to get Alan a position at Columbia since he never got past his internship year, had a 10-year gap in his resume, and had no publications that weren't a political screed. But when they got to South Africa, Alan had the best credential. He had been a political prisoner of the United States, and people believed him. Finally, however, with his seventh round of cancer caught up with him, he died in June of 2009. Not many us, of us, of course, will ever have Berkman's particular blend of personal conviction, willingness to take risks, loving and principled support, and ability to suspend fears in order to make commitments. Most of us will not turn to violence as a way to make social change. Berkman's commitments, however, to equality and solidarity never wavered as his tactics for making change did. As we now confront the structures of power that Berkman and his comrades tried to overcome, we are asked anew whether we are willing to act and in what ways. It is time, I think, for a new co-conspiracy that is attuned to the very specifics of our political now as we continue the work that Alan Berkman, others like him, did to try and change the American story. I'm not suggesting we do what he did, but only to consider how to use our principles to not merely go on a march, but to make a commitment for all of our lives. We should remember when we do this, however, to be wary that the charge of being un-American or even a terrorist will again be used. Just recently, for example, Rudy Giuliani, who prosecuted some of the cases around the Brinks robbery, but not the one he's claiming here, mind you, um, had gone after one of Berkman's comrades because she sits on an organization that helps fund Black Lives Matter. One final personal note. In case you wondered how I got into this story, some of you know this. I grew up with Alan Berkman. I went to college at Cornell with him when I was organizing men to burn their draft cards, and he was a frat boy. And we split over the use of violence in the early 1970s. I knew him really as a boy. I went to his bar mitzvah. I knew him as a late adolescent, and I got to know him as an adult only through writing this book. I haven't changed my mind about the path I took, and I'm glad it wasn't his but thinking through what he did to make makes us consider what it really means to be a co-conspirator and to fight for social change in America. Thank you. Okay, so now I have to end this, right? Uh, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> oh, you have to figure out, oh, stop share. Okay, yeah, got it. Exactly. Okay, I'm back. Exactly. Oh my goodness, that was so good. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You so, much. <laughs> so, did you want to speak a little bit more or do you want to take questions? No, I, I mean, I want people to read the book. I really don't think people can pay attention for more than 20 minutes on a Zoom thing without going brain dead. So, um, I, I think we should, I'll just answer questions. Okay. One thing I wanted to tell people is that they're also welcome to put questions in the chat if they're not really into um, asking, raising their hand and asking questions, they are more than welcome <coughs> to put questions in the chat and I'll, I'll ask those to Susan. So um, as I said again, if you click at the bottom of your screen where it says participants and it has that little number, um, there should be a raise hand thing or um, at the bottom of your screen, there is a um, 
if you're on a device, there's a raise hand thing. Okay. If you don't see that, just raise your hand and I will see you eventually. But I have four, <laughs> four pages. Okay, Lizzie, can you unmute yourself? Hi, Susan. That was Hi, so Lizzie. interesting. I loved hearing it all pu pulled together. I can't wait to read the book. Um, so my question is about your high school years with him. <laughs> and was, was, was he the kind of guy that when this all came to light, everyone was saying to themselves who went to high school with him, oh yeah, he was always a little whatever. Or was it like completely out of the blue and you couldn't imagine that you know, this kid who goes to college and med school turned out this way. Um, I actually, the, the most amazing thing was, and when I started to work on it is, um, people kept talking about what a gentle and kind man he was. And I thought I had lost my mind because I remember him as completely competitive. Um, partly that's me because he got the history award at, at graduation. I was really pissed. Um, <laughs> Um, but he was very squeamish, actually. We were lab partners in biology, and he got nauseous um, dissecting the frog, and I had a great time doing it. But um, he, um, no, he was pretty arrogant. He was very driven. Um, I mean, he had a sweetness to him, but there was an underlying kind of anger a little bit. But he, and I, as those of you who read the book know, I have his high school girlfriend through college's letters that they wrote back and forth to each other. And he, you know, he told racist jokes. Um, he was totally interested in um, making it. He, you know, he was, um, you know, his family really pushed him to, to be um, a serious doctor. Um, and um, I, it was a complete shock to me, frankly. Um, in the early 70s, when I, this is in the book too, we, he and I had, so when Bobby Seal and um, Erica Huggins were on trial for a murder they did not commit in New Haven, Alan by then had moved very much further to the left of me. And he came to see me, we were both still in New York, and he said to me, if, if, they're, if Bobby Seal's convicted, are you willing to take up arms? And I looked at him like he was out of his mind, and I said, absolutely not. Um, for two reasons. One is I'm a labor historian originally by training. I know we always get killed. And second of all, um, I didn't think we could win. I mean, if I actually thought we would be like, you know, Castro, we could come down from the hills and, um, you know, shoot our way out of this problem. I might have thought about it, but I, but I basically was a chicken shit and I just thought this was nuts. And um, so it was a shock. It really was. Now, some of our other high school friends are on, so maybe they can say what they remember about him. Um, as well, but it certainly was not, you know, he wasn't a red diaper baby. It was not expected. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. Um, T. Richard, uh, can yeah. you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Hey, Susan. Hi, um, uh, so I met uh, Alan 20 years ago in South Africa when I went to my first international AIDS conference and I've been volunteering with Health Gap ever since. Um, so, and to this day, I still call on him for inspiration because the man was just incredible. Um, and actually this year I, I took a leave from my, my for-profit job to uh, help out Health Gap, uh, well, with an interim uh, transition. And um, I just wanna let you know, Susan, that we do three hour Zoom calls <laughs> all the time. And pay attention the whole time. Thank you so much. I got the book, I uh, haven't re read too deeply yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And thank you for all your help. All the people who loved him really, I couldn't have written this book without your trust in me and your willingness to talk about him. Well, Susan, in the um, comments, people are telling you how amazing this is, your presentation, your book. Um, some, somebody asked um, how studying Alan's life fits in with the rest of your body of, of fine, fine work. Oh, wow. Um, it's a little at, at, out on some level. I mean, I, you know, I'm known as a, hist I, I started out in, in labor history and women's labor history, and then I moved into the history of nursing, and then I spent 20 years working on uh, medical research issues around the Tuskegee syphilis study. And I fell into writing this, actually, because um, I, got, I, I got this great honor. I was asked to give the plenary lecture and my, in my, um, 
academic association called the American Association for the History of Medicine. And it's supposed to be new work. And um, I didn't have any. I mean, like most academics, you have things in your file cabinet. I had zilch um, because I just finished the Tuskegee book. I'd involved in exposing this study in Guatemala. And I had um, nothing. I mean, I literally had nothing. And so I tried to figure out what the hell I was going to do at this talk. And I started to really think about the fact that I was going to be at Johns Hopkins, where we were giving this talk, and where I was giving this talk, and where there's a famous painting called The Great Doctors. And my pal, David Rosner, who's also on here, and I um, are sort of infamous in our field for an essay we wrote when we were little babes in grad school called Beyond the Great Doctors, which was an argument for looking beyond the ideas of great white doctors and thinking about um, the social history of medicine and its context. So I thought, wow, I'm going to be at Hopkins. The great white doctor picture is there. And no one thinks I'm going to write about white doctors. I'd be like the last person on the planet that expect to do this. So why not? So I decided, so I wrote this paper that started this called, um, and then I tried to figure out who I would use. So I used John Cutler, a physician who had run the study, this horrible study in Guatemala that I helped exposed. And then I thought I needed somebody else as a counter. And I had written a little bit about Alan when we were uh, for our reunions in college. Um, so I thought, I'll see if there's anything. So I call, I made contact through my friend Dick Clapp with Barbara Zeller, Alan's um, wife and widow. And I said, look, I know, you know who I am. I know who you are, but we've never met. Can I come talk to you? And so we spent a whole day together. And then she said, I have this room here. And then there were all of these files. And there were Alan's <coughs> un unpublished uh, prison diary journal. There were thousands of letters. There were all the legal papers. And I knew I had enough to write a book. I mean, to write a, a, a lecture. And then I just kept getting more and more involved in it. So yes and no, but not really. It really was a, I mean, in some ways, it's a culmination, I guess, of my own political life. And I think for people of our generation and our politics, um, a kind of path not taken, you know? I mean, there was obviously a point where some of us could have done what Alan and his friends did, and some of us chose to do that, and some of us, you know, backed away. And so I was just trying to figure out how that all happened. Well, that must have taken a long time. It, it, it did, but took less time than my other books, honestly, because what I did was I um, took advantage of Wellesley's uh, get out of jail card, which meant I could, I could teach half time for a couple of years and still get paid a reasonable salary. And so I had much more time to write it. So it, I start to finish probably eight or nine years, which is, for me is really fast. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, Bob Letterer, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Hi, Susan. And, hi, Bob. Uh, and also, hi to Barbara. It's so great to see you. Susan, what a magnificent book. I, it was such a pleasure to read every page. Um, and I, I was so privileged to be able to make my small contribution to sharing the work that Alan and I had done in 1999 to co-found the Health Gap Coalition, which um, you know was purely and entirely uh, born out of his as you said a minute ago, his rage um, at going to an, not just one international AIDS conference, but being part of the AIDS community and seeing the lip service being given to making these powerful, then new uh, antiretroviral drugs available worldwide, but in reality doing absolutely nothing to challenge the power relations of the, um, the drug companies uh, mega profits with unlimited patent rights while people um, got sick and, and died by the millions throughout the global south. So um, I'm so happy that that particular story has now been told on the public record in a very full way. And I have to say, I'm amazed at the amount of research you did. The, the documentation, the number of footnotes is mind boggling. So congratulations. You should the on ones I cut out. You, <laughs> I, I, was, um, I was trained at Cornell by somebody I kept calling a Talmudic footnoter in the old days where the text was this big and the footnotes were like the commentary at the bottom. Um, so, you know, you just you get, tra you get trained. That's how you get trained to do it right. And so that All you right. can prove what you know and where you got it and people can follow it back if right. they have questions and that's really important that's how we share yeah well um now and now it's all spelled out there so i guess my my question to you at this point is as you l l now can look back at his 
trajectory. And, you know, as you very carefully pointed out that his, his ideological views did evolve over the periods of where, from when, you know, the period when you first knew him, when he was utterly apolitical to the period when he became a leftist and then became a revolutionary leftist um, with the above ground and then went underground and then was imprisoned. Um, and of course, all of his um, amazing post-prison AIDS work. So what do you observe in retrospect, having done all this research about, um, and you, you made a, a brief reference to it earlier tonight about, um, that obviously you didn't agree with his turn toward underground armed um, activity, um, but comparing what you thought at the time the activity, when it was front page news about um, bank robberies and bombings versus what you think now after having spent many, many months immersed in his writings and his changing viewpoint on what he himself and his comrades had been part of for all those years. What, you know, how, how would you assess all that? Huh. <laughs> um, I just think, you know, at the time, and I mean, I wrote about this in the book, at the time, I just thought, I mean, remember that they're doing this not during the 60s and 70s when um, a lot of this bombing was going on. I mean, I remember in the late 70s when I was pregnant, I, I had this dress I bought during a bomb scare at the public library because I left the public library. I went next door to Saks Fifth Avenue during the bomb scare and bought a dress um, to wear. So I used to call it my bomb scare dress. But, um, you know, at the time, you know, I, ha I think I... I, I, under, I really did understand um, the non-lethal version of the, the violence and the attempt to change things. And one of Alan's comrades had a great quote that I used somewhere in the book in which she said, we just got tired of seeing all the bodies um, on our side alone. Um, so you can understand, and that's what worries me some about what's going on and why people like Dwayne Dixon really do worry me. Um, about where we're, um, where we're going. And I, the problem is, as I said in the talk, I think the problem was that if you name your small group the May 19th Communist Organization, you're not exactly gonna have thousands of people joining up. Um, and I, you know, so I think I've thought, I'm trying to think about how we make arguments for people um, who understand why, uh, what it means to be a co-conspirator, what it means to be really committed through the different things you do in your life. Um, around fighting um, against imperial actions and, and racism and sexism and all the other things we're concerned with um, without necessarily having to resort to violence um, because I don't think you can win that way. Although I tell you each day, it gets scarier and scarier here. And, and just one last quick thing. I just wanna really applaud you for honoring his life and the way you told the story while also expressing your principal differences with his decisions, but you never did it in a way that, that ridiculed him or debased him. But, you know, you just said, well, I, I don't agree with this, this turn that he took, um, but you always could see underlying all of that was his deep, deep principle and love of people. Right. And exactly. I, I appreciate that a lot. Well, that's what you all taught me. I mean, it isn't just in the, in the doc, it comes, you know, if you're a good historian, you read the documents and you listen hard to the people who talk to you. And I learned it all from you guys, really. I wouldn't have come to this without what you taught me. Thank you. Thank you. Steven, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. <clears throat> hi, Susan. Hi, Steven. Hi. Um, I haven't finished the book yet, but uh, I'm part way through. I, I, I had a, I wanted to say, and maybe this question is both for you and for Barbara. Um, the the part that that's that's been the most, it was the most painful for me to read was the chapter about rectification. And I I, I wondered, I, I, I mean, it must be amazing for you, I think, to have this book coming out right at this moment, where in some ways, I, I, and you couldn't have foreseen that, no. <laughs> starting to. I mean, it's as though the world has caught up with you or with Alan. But I wonder, um, both for you and for uh, Barbara and, and maybe for other, others on this call, um, how that, that moment of uh, political correctness looks to you now 
or, or looks to any of us now. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I also want to say, Stephen, really, uh, uh, to me, the correspondence that Stephen has with Alan when they're in, when Alan's in prison, is I think the most insightful part of trying to understand um, what had happened to him. And I don't know if you remember, you've gotten that far, Stephen, yet, but there's this correspondence that you have with him about what you called the I we problem, um, about how much he uh, trusted his own judgment and his own thoughts and how much he felt he had to be part of the collective, which is part of what rectification. And for those of us who lived through the worst moments of the women's movement, we used to call criticism, self-criticism um, at the end of each meeting where you basically beat your breast and said what you had done wrong. Um, how difficult all of that was. And somehow we all thought at the time that this was the way to give up privilege, to um, come to, to, to really listen to other people um, in the room and to acknowledge different forms of power. Um, so, you know, we're having a similar debate if you think about, for those of you who have followed this debate about something that's now called The Letter that was published in Harper's Magazine about two weeks ago, where people are really concerned about the silencing of, um, some voices that the problem is that the left, just like the right in some ways, but the left often tries to find a way to, to make sure, frankly, that it also doesn't have police agents in its groups, but also to make sure that people are following the right decisions and agree on a group um, position on things. And one of the ways you do that is to try to get inside people's heads. And there just was a lot of trying to figure out how to do this. And we didn't do a great job of it. We destroyed a lot of marriages. We destroyed, we forced people to do things they didn't really want to do. Um, we made people feel guilty. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why when I teach, I tell my students that they want to be guilty. Now my mother's passed, but I used to tell them they should just call up my mother and she'll make you feel guilty about anyone, but they should please leave their guilt at the other side of the door when they came into my classroom. Um, because guilt is utterly about you. So I, that's, I think, trying to think about how we manage a new revolutionary period without forcing people to be in those kinds of positions. And that's why I thought the conversation in the book between you and him is actually really important. Um, Dick? Yeah, hi, hi, Susan. Hi, Dick. <laughs> yes, I, I'm tempted to try to follow up on what you and Stephen were just doing. I think it's another hour, actually. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to sort of re introduced what was introduced by the little clip of Alan uh, from 60 Minutes, which was what he had to endure in prison and, and the healthcare disasters, multiple disasters, a couple of which Barbara actually intervened at the last minute before he expired or they allowed him to expire in prison. But some of the most compelling or dramatic parts of the book I thought were um, when he actually had to bite the IV tube so that it would send a send a uh, message to the nursing station that they would come and, you know, kind of retrieve him. Another one was when he was at Marion Prison, Federal Prison in Marion, I think you had this great quote that the only licensed physician in the prison was Alan. That's right. So, That's right. and then there's this last thing at Mayo Clinic, uh, which I think for Alan at least was a much more, um, you know, reasonable experience, but nevertheless, it sort of gives the whole range of prison health that he experienced firsthand. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important theme that you wove into this book. It's, uh, and as I say, I think the biting his IV tube was the most dramatic. Yeah, it's an amazing, um, it's an amazing story. And about I, you know, in, in the interest of making this 20 to 25 minutes long, I left out all the fancy drama. Um, so you have to read the book to find out. <laughs> but Dick's right, that he survived. I mean, what he said, I thought in the 60 minutes thing sums it up. If he hadn't been a doctor, he would have been dead. Yeah. And if Barbara hadn't been able to come in and intervene, he would have been dead. Um, somebody asked in the chat if you know if there are any plans by anyone else to work on publishing his prison diaries or more of his work. And of course, thank you so much for this incredible book and all of your work. Ah, well, that's very kind. Yes, actually, um, I, I've, I'm in discussion with a, a man named Terry Bisson, who was also part of his group, who some of you may know as a kind of lefty science fiction writer, um, about whether or not we could get his prison diary cleaned up enough um, in 
pieces or some of the letters um, to get it published by one of the left presses on the West Coast. So Terry and I spoke about this a couple of um, years ago and I need to just, you know, follow up on this. But once it, once this book was out, I wanted to do that. I mean, originally he calls his prison um, uh, journal um, Brother Doc, which I loved. And for a long time, that's what I called this book. And then I realized it couldn't be the title, A, because it was his, and B, because then it really is only about the prison years. And that would, I know that he told, um, I can't remember who he told this to, Dick. I can't remember if it was you or someone else who he said that he thought the best things he had ever done was Health Gap. And so um, mm -hmm. I wanted to honor that by not having the book title reflect only the time he was a political prisoner. Um, someone else um, agrees that this is tremendous and that the house of God has characterized this generation of doctor activists and you capture a lot of nuance in the new left split. Um, haven't read yours yet, but I'm reminded of description of Savio's conversation in Subversives by Seth Rosenfeld. Yes. Yes, I agree. I don't know if that's a question. I just I agree. <laughs> I mean, I haven't read Subversives in a while, but it's not my yeah. show. <laughs> God, this isn't orals, is it? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're emerita. You're you're. Yeah, I don't have to do. I don't have to prove it again, right? <laughs> um, Mary Patton. Hey, Mary. Hey, hi, Susan. Congratulations! It's such an incredible accomplishment. I, I haven't even had a chance to start it, but it's sitting right here. Ah. <laughs> but um. Anyway, I just, I, 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 maybe I'm the only person here, probably not, who believes that actually guilt has some social usefulness for people <laughs> engaged in struggle. No, I'm serious. I'm not, I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of what was brought up about rectification and criticism, self-criticism and the ways, you know, in, in May 19th that often manifested as a kind of interpretation of what was happening in the Cultural Revolution in China, you know, where we, you know, th there was a wash your face campaign in the Cultural Revolution and one of our comrades on May 19th changed the name to the smash your face campaign. And you know, we, there, there's yeah. so many examples like that. And of course, it, you know, there are issues of cruelty that um, have to be reckoned with and, and so on. But I, I, you know, it's complicated because, you know, so many white people who have struggled, who've taken on a particular struggle on the left against white supremacy have been, you know, met with uh, accusations of being guilt ridden, um, you know, white people just want to kill our parents or something. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I just think especially now, uh, we, we have a chance to look at what different kinds of models do we need to develop in the course of struggle that are about confronting one another and confronting ourselves, but in a way that's generative, right? I mean, mm -hmm. are we, what, what we suffered from was a kind of very small group, in my view anyway, was a kind of small group uh, mentality and where we increasingly held each other up to unbelievable standards. But we have to be, I mean, this, you probably know the activist Mariam Kaba, right? She's, she's also a comrade and a friend and some of you might have read, she had an op-ed in the New York Times in the last six weeks or so. And Mariam is, is like this leading activist to this kind of younger generation of, you know, uh, queer black women led m social movements. And Mariam struggles all the time with how do we, how do we deal with, you know, contradictions amongst ourselves, including really serious issues like violence between people. Mm -hmm. You know, and we have to be able, I mean, she's raising the questions and and has no answers, but anyway, I'll shut up. No, I, I think the reason, um, 
I think I was just laughing when you were speaking only because you're not Jewish. So I think guilt is just the thing about Jews have a thing about guilt. But um, I, so that's part of it. No, but I, I also think guilt in the end is about me. You know, it's about oh, my feelings, what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. And so I think it's a place to start to realize what happened, but I don't think it's a place to end up. Um, which is why I tell my students to leave it at the door because I think we have to figure out you know how how to come to terms with our with for white people anyway for with our with various privileges um and the question then is what do you do with them you know what what are you willing I mean Alan clearly was a white male you know highly educated physician he could have I think I left this out but the FBI you know at, at every turn kept saying you know we'll put you in witness protection you can get out of this story um you'll be fine and he turned them down you know, every time um, around that. So I think we have to find a way, and I think we're struggling for that now, a kind of way of speaking about all of these issues without making it so deeply individual and personal um, about it. I mean, I think um, it's important to understand white privilege, but I think it's really important to do what I said, at, you know, I teach my students in history of medicine, you know, to focus upstream, to really try to think about you know, where the structures come from and what we can do to confront them, not just all the individual work. I think you have to do both, but I also don't think you can just stay mired in yourself. Ezra, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, I, Hi. More about the book, I guess. Hi, yeah. Hi, Ezra. Ezra's the one with the great line from Alan's memorial service that I love. <laughs> Thanks. I, you know, he was a big influence on me, and I, you know, I knew a lot about him. But when I, and it took me a long time before I could actually read the book, you know, because it was kind of, it was too emotional. But then, when I started reading it, you know, I couldn't put it down. And the, there's so many sides to Alan that I really didn't know all about, and it goes back to high school, on to the very end of his life. And I don't think anybody could have done it except for you because you knew him through the entire, well, at least through, through the early part, which almost- Yeah, like I, I think that's right. I, and as I said to Barbara, frankly, um, the good news was I wasn't in this group. So that meant they didn't have political fights that I remembered that you said this or you said that. I mean, I couldn't write about some of the women's movement groups yeah. I was part of because I'm still too angry about crap that happened. But um, this one, I had enough distance. I mean, I had both insider knowledge and distance, which I think really helped. And then you all were just amazing in providing all this information. It's the way you conveyed it too. And the prison experience was much more, was deeper and more dramatic than I knew. You know, he talked about it, but you really, um, well, he did that, you know, it came from, God bless um, from his, uh, all of you who yeah. sent their letters back. I mean, it's his, it's his words. Yeah. But, oh, and then I won't keep going on, but, you know, I was with him at the AIDS conference in Durban with the treatment action group and so on, but I didn't know that he was, um, that he, that his, so, so um, the cancer was, um, yeah. Right, it was so disabled, it was growing at the same time. You know, he yeah. just hid it from everyone. You, you just wouldn't know, you know. Yeah. So that was, there are many things about it. I just thought it was great. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. No, I mean, I think there's just, I mean, there's a whole book just to be written about Alan and his cancer experience. I mean, I, it was just stunning to think about um, what he went through. And I have to say, it, I found it, um, very inspiring because I had a, a bad fall seven years ago while I was just starting the book and I broke my pelvis and I was um, in the hospital for a number of weeks and you know I was in real pain and miserable and all I kept thinking was I'm not behind bars you know uh, the, nobody's trying to kill me here um, you know it was just um, that's part of the story is quite stunning about his just incredible strength okay um we have a bunch of people. The first one who raised their hand was Bruce. If you can unmute yourself. Just a quick uh, comment. Um, the thing that was most striking about Alan to me was his uh, loyalty. 
and his friendship and his commitment to his individual relationships as he struggled with them. And he was heroic. He was exemplary. He represented um, a person and a personality who I didn't have other access to. There are heroes in my life, but Alan was one of them. And that he <laughs> considered someone such as myself to be a friend uh, was just a testimony to uh, his relatability, his essence that, you know, we were in New York together before he went to Wounded Knee. And uh, he went and I didn't. <laughs> and uh, right. there was just something, uh, he wasn't shy about trying to recruit people either, but he was very open to the struggle, particularly to the kinds of criticism he was subject to and how it forced him to confront aspects of himself. Um, one thing that did not appear in the book, and I'll close with this, is that Alan told me he had never had a depressed day in his life. That is actually in, in the book. That quote okay. is in the book. Yep. <laughs> Until he went to jail. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you for the book. Uh, hello, thank Barbara. You. Hello, Dick. Hello, Steve. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. You know, when Bruce was speaking, I actually, um, the file in my, um, um, in my file cabinet um, on his friendships with other men was called the Four Amigos at one point. I mean, and I kept thinking today about the comments about John Lewis um, and about how, what a decent man he was to everybody who knew him um, and how much he cared about them. And I think the parallels are, you know, without being going into hyperbole here, I think are worth really thinking about. Um, Liz? Hi, Susan. Yep. Hi, thank you so much for this book. Hi, Liz. Um, hi. Um, so I just wanted to speak briefly about something that I think is so important. I've had the privilege of knowing Alan through much of his life, and he has made a tremendous impact on me and has been instrumental in so many important decisions that I've made in my life, from deciding to be a physician assistant, um, to going to public health school. And I think for me, what's unbelievable about Alan, and I'm kind of saying this um, as an aftermath to other things people are saying, is that he was just a regular old person in so many ways. He had his strengths, he had his weaknesses, he had all of the horrible things about him that people have kind of laughed about, but he really was a tremendous and beautiful and wonderful person. And you've talked about how you wanna use this book in part to go into college classrooms and talk to people. And I think the thing about Alan is that he enables people, his, the trajectory of his life enables people to understand how people can change, how you can go, go from being who he was to being somebody who made such a contribution to so many people. And I think somebody at his funeral said this amazing thing, which was when we think about it, Alan has saved millions of lives through his work, both as a prison doctor and in helping to deal with health gap. And that's the thing, Alan, Alan is just an example of how you don't have to be a genius, you don't have to be brilliant, you don't have to be anybody can be Alan if they decide they wanna be Alan. And I think many people who I went to public health school with at Columbia when Alan was a professor there, that was the thing I would always say to people as they would speak about how unbelievable he was. I would say he's not any different than you are. You could be him in yeah. another 30 years when you've done all of the groundwork to be him. Yep. And so anyway, that's mainly what I wanted to say. Thank you, Liz. Thanks. And thank you for your book. I loved it. Thank you. I appreciate that deeply, especially for all of you who knew him really, really well as a grown up, which I did not. Someone in the chat actually said, um, although we've been uh, 
writing for 30 plus years against the narrative of the great doctors, it seems as though you wrote about a great one after all. <laughs> yeah. All the historians of medicine who thought I was ruining their field are probably lying in their graves cheering. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dick, did you want to say something else? Well, I put my hand down because I thought it was a little bit further away from what I had planned to say, but David Rosner asked in the chat, how did Alan get hired at Columbia School yeah. of Public Health? And Ezra, Ezra is the reason. I mean, Ezra and his right. family, actually, right. are the reason. And that's, that's in the book, too. Yeah. But um, I think kudos are due to the Susser family for, and Zena Stain for, for having seen what a gem Alan was and uh, you know, helped him get on to his second career. Right. Does anyone else? have any questions anybody like raising a hand like this that doesn't wasn't using the i, I just wanted to say thanks and oh, but it was barbara too because barbara is the one that um that connected with xena and then and then it all went from there right so. it's in the book it's in the book i promise <laughs> barbara do you want to say anything i'm putting her on the spot I don't know if she's still there. Anyway, I, I'm just enormously grateful to all of you who had faith that I would do the do it right. Um, and I couldn't have done it, as I said, I really couldn't have done it with both everything all of you saved um, and your willingness to speak to me. Barbara's right here. I think she has something to say. Okay. Wait. I did. Am I unmuted now? Yep, there you okay. are. Um, it was wonderful, Susan. I, 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 I wanted to say that I thought an incredible strength of the book was that you contextualized every period of his life to the period of history that was going on. And it was so helpful as, you, as we all struggled with these questions. And I think it's particularly interesting that the book came out, we initially said, oh, the book is coming out during the pandemic, which is one way that it reflects on his life, but the other way is, you know, through the Black Lives Matter movement, which right. to me is like the whole book even meant more to me as I experienced this period of time, because, you know, our, our decisions in the context were, were totally influenced by our relationships one-on-one -on -one with militant Black, Puerto Rican, and other national liberation struggles. We were challenged by those relationships. We, this didn't come out of our own brains as much as the fact that we really were in a historical period of time where these meetings and these talks and, you know, uh, helped, you know, define um, what decisions were made. And, you know, certainly at this point in my life, I uh, have a lot of issues about many of those, those um, uh, decision points, but that's, I thought the book did that very well. It's like, um, uh, it helped. It helped me to remember. It helped because sometimes you look back on your life and said, I'd like to just think about this period. So <laughs> very, very appreciated and a, a real treasure and certainly a, tre a treasure for our family and our extended family and chosen family. So um, thank, thank you. you. And it's lovely seeing so many people. I couldn't see everybody, but I saw the names. It was just really nice. To see yeah, you. really. Thank you. Was here tonight. Jennifer, yeah. thank you. You know, oh, it, this was actually really you. amazing. <laughs> This was so special. Uh huh. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank and you everybody, thank you. And Jennifer, you'll send me um, information about the recording so that we can um, put this up, so yes. people who um, couldn't make we'll, it can watch it. We're gonna um, put it on our YouTube page, and I'll send you a link, and okay. you can put it wherever you want it as well. So okay, terrific. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Good night. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Bye.